Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'll do my best to summarize, but that going off script is not usually what I feel comfortable doing. I am indeed Wendy Underhill. I work for the National Conference of State Legislatures. We are a bipartisan organization that supports the work of legislators throughout the nation. So we work for you all and for legislative staff. And if there are any questions or uh, research projects that come out at the end of this hearing, you can certainly send them my way and we will do our best to answer. Echo, it's like difficult to understand what you're saying. Is there any way to turn the volume down on the TV? I see. Never mind. All right, so um, in the next 12 to 15 minutes, I'm going to give you a brief overview of how states do redistricting. And to do that, I'm going to look first at who does the redistricting and then what standards they use for doing it and then what happens in the case of a legislature failing to be able to do that. So uh, in the, with the question of who does redistricting, if you're talking about legislative maps, then 37 states have the legislature draw the maps. And if you're talking about congressional redistricting, then you're talking about 43 states have the legislature draw the maps. Now, amongst that 43 are seven that only have one congressional seat, so they don't really have to do much, but they still have a procedure for doing it should they ever be so fortunate as to get a second seat. The other states, uh, 13 for legislative seats and uh, where are we, seven for congressional seats, use some form of a commission. And uh, those, at, when I talk about a commission, I'm talking about giving primary responsibility for drawing the lines as opposed to a backup or an advisory commission. So uh, there are variations in how legislatures approach this. And uh, you, you can see some of them on the screen here. I do have one error on this. I do say that there are two that bypass the governor. In fact, there are three. In um, North Carolina, neither congressional nor legislative maps uh, uh, go to the governor, but in Florida and Mississippi, congressional plans are subject to a governor's action, whereas the legislative ones aren't. I just wanted to make that point clear because I did submit something with an error in it. So other variations are uh, when redistricting is done, whether a special session is used for it, um, and uh, uh, what happens in the case of a backup, which we will do at the end, and then also whether a majority vote is sufficient or whether something above a majority vote is required. And in that case, there are two states that require a two-thirds vote of uh, the chambers to enact a plan through the legislature. Now, I did throw up a slide about Iowa. In our taxonomy, Iowa is a legislative driven state and that's because the legislature does vote on a plan, but the plan is first developed by nonpartisan staff, legislative staff, and it's submitted to the legislature for an up and down vote. And if it's voted down, then it goes back and the staff tries again. And if that second attempt is also voted down, a third plan is sent forward, and then the legislature can amend it, as you might expect with any other kind of a bill. And so far since 1980, either the first or the second plan has been adopted in all cases. So I wanted to just make sure that you heard about that. And then. Uh, um, I didn't put a slide up about Maryland. Uh, that has a somewhat unique plan as well. There, there is a commission that reports to the governor, and that commission and governor develop a map, and they submit that map to the legislature for approval. And if after 45 days the legislature hasn't done something different, the governor's map goes into effect. Um, most often, the legislature has been developing its own maps and will pass its own maps. But I just wanted to bring that variation to you. Then we'll talk about um, uh, commissions, and as I said, I'm going to mostly be speaking about those that have primary responsibility and not so much those backup ones and the advisory commissions. So on this map, um, all of the states that are put in color use a commission for doing their legislative maps. And those that are in the dark brown, or maybe it looks black to you, or maroon, those states also use a commission for their congressional maps. So what we've got is that if you do congressional maps with a commission, you also do legislative maps, but the reverse is not true. You could just choose to use a commission for legislative maps. And just like the state legislative process varies in a bunch of different ways, so does the process used by commissions. And what we've got here is that the size can be quite different. The three is the smallest commission and 18 is the largest commission. Um, and then the rules vary on 
uh, how uh, maps get approved. Uh, a simple majority is the most common approach, but the more recently established commissions uh, do have a requirement for some kind of a bipartisan vote. And this means that they require more than a majority and that that more than a majority needs to include some portion of the minority members um, on the commission. And I would also add that most of these commissions are linked in some way to the legislature, either that the legislative leaders appoint members or uh, that they have the ability to select within a smaller group or to um, throw out potential members of the commission. So the legislature is not cut out in any state entirely. So I'm now going to talk about several different variations on uh, commissions, and we'll start with Arizona. It does have five members, and the selection process starts with the legislative, uh, excuse me, with the appellate court creating a pool of 25 members. And those nominees are 10 Democrats, 10 Republicans, and five who are unaffiliated. And the four legislative leaders do choose um, amongst that pool for the first four members and then those four members choose the fifth member from the unaffiliated camp and if those four members can't come to terms then the appellate court appoints the chair so it's that piece where, and that the, the chair is what makes that um, an independent commission according to Arizona's definitions uh, the Arizona Independent Commission has been challenged on a number of different things, um, and this year I'd like you to know that the Senate President uh, did propose some changes, and one of the changes he was looking for was to enlarge that commission from five to eight or nine. That didn't go through, but um, those were um, efforts uh, underway. And now I've got California up, and I know you're going to hear more about that, so I'm going to just skip right over that. If you want me to say anything, I will. And um, now uh, we'll talk about um, New Jersey. But before I do, I just want to say that when you're talking about an independent commission, the definition of that can vary um, by who's giving you the answer. Some say that Arizona and California are the only independent commissions. Some say that Idaho and Washington's uh, commissions are also independent. It depends on whether you can be a legislator uh, to be appointed. It depends on who does the appointing. And so for NCSL's purposes, we consider all 13 commissions, no matter how they're constituted, to be commissions. We don't really like to draw that. Is it an independent one or not? All right, so I did want to put up one of the um, bipartisan commissions for a little more detail. Um, uh, in this case, uh, there are 12 members. Two are appointed by each of the legislative leaders, and two are appointed by each of the major political parties. So that gives you 12. And then the 13th member is selected by those 12 members originally. And that person sort of shuttles back and forth between the two parties to come to agreement. And in this case, um, the 13th member cannot have been a part of a political party for the last five years. Now, Ohio, it sounds as though you, you know a fair amount about your neighbor, Ohio, right now. It's been in the news twice in the, uh, this decade for changes to redistricting processes. Um, in 2015, the legislature sent a ballot measure to the voters to create a seven-member bipartisan commission for legislative redistricting. And it's composed of, um, I hope I get it right, the Attorney General, the Secretary of State and someone appointed by the governor, and then each of the four legislative leaders appoints someone. So all of those people will be a Democrat or a Republican. And the requirement for passing a uh, uh, plan out of that Ohio redistricting commission is that it must include at least two votes from the minority party. So it, uh, that's what makes this a change from where it was before. And um, this year, they've gone to another step. Now the question was, what should they do with congressional redistricting, as opposed to legislative, which we've just talked about? And again, the legislature put forward a proposal which will be voted on in May by the voters. And it did get almost unanimous support from the legislatures, legislators um, to, go, to go forward. And I'm calling it a hybrid plan. And by that, I mean it has a role for the legislature, and it also has a role for the commission. So the legislature takes the first stab at doing redistricting. And if they can craft a plan that gets uh, three-fifths of the vote in both chambers and also gets 50% of the vote of the minority party members, then it 
is enacted. And the reason they have that extra piece is that they do have super majorities in both houses there right now, so you could have a three-fifths majority requirement but still not have a bipartisan plan. So they've got two, two qualifiers to pass that plan. So if the legislature isn't able to do that, then it goes over to that commission that got created in 2015 for them to do it, and they do it through the same process that they have, which requires two minority members to vote um, affirmatively. And if they can't do it, then it comes back to the legislature, so there's a third plan, and it's actually got a 3A and 3B. 3A is that if the legislature at that point can pass a plan that has three-fifths of the votes and 50 percent, or excuse me, 33 percent of the minority caucus votes, it goes into effect. And if they can't do that, they can use a simple majority, pass a plan, and then that reopens redistricting four years later. So there's, that's a pretty heavy penalty if you can't get to a bipartisan plan that you're going to go through the whole process again. And I did not put up a slide about New York, but I, um, after thinking about it over the weekend, it might fit the hybrid camp as well. In New York in 2014, the legislature sent to the people a uh, ballot measure to create an advisory commission. So ordinarily I would be sort of ignoring an advisory commission as not having the actual power. But in this case, they've said that um, just like with Iowa, if this commission sends forward plan, their first plan, the legislature can vote it up or down. If they vote it down, it goes back and the commission again sends forward a plan up, and, up or down. And then again on the third time, the, um, the legislature can amend it. And so it is in fact advisory, but there's a pretty strong incentive there to work with something that would come from the commission. Um, so some advisors say that what matters isn't so much who does the redistricting as what are the rules governing redistricting. And so those could be called uh, principles or criteria for redistricting. And these are often set out in constitution, but I will note that they can be done in statute or they can be done in guidelines that a commission or a committee or a legislature adopts right prior to the um, uh, redistricting cycle. So I've divided them into two camps, and the first camp is, uh, excuse me, first we'll just start with federal requirements. Not surprisingly, all states need to follow federal law, and this re relates particularly to um, equal uh, population and to not um, diluting uh, the minority vote. So then going on from there, I've divided criteria into two camps, and on this first slide we have the traditional requirements. And these are ones that have been used by a variety of different states, and I have put the number of states that have each of these criteria uh, on it. Um, and I will note that you can have these criteria or the new ones that are coming on the next slide, you can have them conflict with each other, so it might be hard to um, both preserve cores of prior districts and stay compact, for instance. So it's good to have uh, rules, and then you can decide, do you want to have uh, those prioritized, or are they all um, of equal value. So on this slide I've put what I'm calling em em emerging criteria, um, and by that I mean ones that have been adopted in more recent years, and they all in some sense I think relate to politics. So for instance, the first is prohibiting um, favoring or disfavoring of a party or a candidate or an incumbent, and 14 states have adopted some variation on this, and I, uh, Florida is the most famous for, for this. Um, I will say that uh, favoring or disfavoring does then lead to a court perhaps deciding what is favoring or disfavoring. So these aren't necessarily easily measurable, or at least measurements for them haven't been adopted. Uh, five states do uh, prohibit the use of political data, and oh, I mentioned Iowa. Maybe I didn't mention that, that in Iowa, when the legislative staff does redistricting, they do not use political data, such as the addresses of incumbents or candidates, such as the voting record um, in the area. And um, that's also true in four other states as well, which I will tell you. Um, Arizona, California, Montana, and Nebraska also prohibit the use of political data. And then competitiveness is a principle in three states, in Arizona, New York, and Washington. Basically, this means that they do value creating districts that are likely to have competitive races. And then most recently, the Ohio um, uh, plan that I mentioned from 2015 had a new and unique um, criteria, which I'm going to read to you because it's hard to understand. Um, the statewide proportion of districts whose voters, based on statewide state and federal partisan general election results during the last 10 years, favor each political party, shall correspond closely to the statewide preferences of the voters of Ohio. So I've 
put that into English. I hope that my English represents that uh, fairly well. We'll see. I think it means that the Commission must attempt to draw lines so that the partisan leanings in those new districts roughly approximate the state's recent statewide partisan preferences. So sometimes the state can't get a plan enacted and maybe uh, get stuck in the courts with it. And when that happens, uh, many states are silent about what the next uh, step should be. But there are a few states that do identify what the next step shall be. And that um, uh, plan B it could be in the Constitution or it could be in code. Uh, in six states, there is a backup commission of some kind that come, gets called into play. I will tell you that the one in Connecticut um, is they, they moved to the backup commission about the day after they constitute their first um, committee to do this. They've just decided that the backup commission is a better place to go. The others um, really are only constituted when the legislature gets stumped. And I will say that the Indiana Commission for Congressional Plans is um, in the Constitution, whereas all the others are the opposite. The Indiana Commission plan is in statute, and all the others are constitutional. <clears throat> Then in uh, three states, the uh, Constitution does explicitly say <clears throat> that the <clears throat> courts, the state Supreme Court, is the backup. And in all the other states, as I mentioned, uh, that question is not addressed. And that's what I've got for you. I'm happy to take questions now. It's possible I won't know the answers, in which case I'm happy to go back and figure out information um, after the fact. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Underhill. Um, I'm going to open with a couple questions, and I'm going to spread it out, and I may have a couple others uh, thereafter. Um, when I was first elected uh, to the General Assembly back in, oh my goodness, 2006, 2007, um, the very first bill I signed on to, co-sponsored, co was then Senator Boscola's uh, redistricting reform bill, which based itself after the Iowa model. Um, that seemed to be the model that most reformers uh, were pointing to for establishing a fair and objective redistricting process. Why do you suppose Iowa is no longer the model for other states to follow? Um, thank you for that question. I, I will tell you that uh, the number one question I get from legislators and legislative staff is, how does Iowa do it? So I am getting the sense that there's still an interest in the Iowa model, but you're absolutely right that no other states have moved towards that model since Iowa's been doing it, what they consider successfully, for decades. And I do hear now also about moving to commissions. Um, there are some things about Iowa that are unique. It's geographically fairly um, similar from corner to corner. It uh, has been demographically fairly similar from corner to corner, although that may be shifting a little bit. And I think it also likes its unique status, um, uh, so that, that seems to work for, for it. It has the other unique status you all know of, too, of um, the first caucuses. Um, and I think what we see in a, in a state like Pennsylvania, where I don't believe you have nonpartisan central staff, the, the move towards creating nonpartisan staff that could do that would be um, a pretty significant culture shift. In the western part of the United States, there are a lot of nonpartisan staff and much less caucus staff. Mm. So there are some other states that certainly could consider it. So that's what I've got for you. Um, okay. Uh, well, thank you for that answer. As you note in your testimony, the size of states' redistricting commissions varies. Based upon your knowledge of other states, do you have any thoughts or on the pluses and minuses of small versus large commissions? Um, I did um, back the envelope math last night on this question about how big are commissions, and the average is 6.7 members, and the mean is, excuse me, the average is 7.6 members, and the mean is six members. So I don't know if that is helpful to you all to think about that or not. Uh, what I, by noticing that Arizona's uh, legislature was asking for their commission to be made larger, the reason that uh, that was uh, their desire was so that one person didn't hold all the power. So if you have two D's and two R's and one person in the middle, that person becomes very powerful. And in Arizona, they felt that that was too powerful. And so if you make it a little bit larger, and in that case, they were thinking of three Democrats, three Republicans, and either two or three independents, then you don't have one person who you feel like is doing the, the whole work. So uh, I suppose you could argue that a large commission uh, might cost more money to put together, but I'm not sure that's what's driving anyone's decision-making about this. Okay. 
Well, thank you. Um, my last question before I recognize the co-chair of the State Government Committee, Senator Williams. Um, as you also note in, our, uh, in your presentation, picking the pickers appears to be the key question in the appointment of states' redistricting commissions. And again, there appears to be a variety of ways states appoint their respective commissions. Based upon your knowledge of other states, do you have any thoughts on the pluses or minuses on the ways states pick the pickers? Uh, thank you. That's a, a critical question and also a hard question. Right. Um, you know, as, as I noted, um, NCSL doesn't Sorry. take a policy position on, on this. I, by using a system like you'll hear about from California, where there's a lengthy vetting process and then there is um, uh, the role of the legislature is merely to remove a few candidates like you might remove potential jurors from a jury list. There is a little role for legislators um, in that. And then it goes to a random pick for, for some of the members, and then the final ones are selected by the ones that already got seated, and they choose those last ones to round out geographic, ethnic, mm. um, economic, perhaps some other kinds of diversity. Uh, so that's how they make their package. And, and I've uh, referred to it as a Rube Goldberg approach, which doesn't on paper maybe look that attractive to other states. California thinks it's uh, definitely hit the nail on the head and they're, they're happy with the way that they're doing it. Uh, <clears throat> Arizona is, has the next most mixed um, development of who can be the members, and that's with this appellate court uh, doing the initial vetting <laughs> and then allowing the legislature to pull from, from mm -hmm. that hat primarily. And so we're trying to find that sweet spot between the uh, needs of, uh, of not making it too, too complicated and uh, having those who know the state as well as anybody, the people in the legislature have some role, is uh, kind of the trick. And there may be some other variations um, that w haven't been enacted yet. I'll try to think of some beyond what we know to be true in the other states. Well, thank you. And just real quick, other than California, and this is for my information, do any other states uh, use a random selection scenario? None that I know of. Okay. You might ask that question of other presenters and see if we hear something different. Well, I, I, I didn't know either, and I was just trying to find out what other yeah. states have, have yeah. done. That's why I asked that question. I'm going to now turn it over to the co-chair of the State Government Committee, Senator Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for being late, Ms. Underhill. Um, we are excited about you and all the testifiers here today. I'm not going to take a lot of time. Um, this is our second hearing, and I think that um, if folks on the Hill don't finally figure out that there is a strong public interest in changing the way that we do this, I think we will never get to that point. But guess what? You won't see many of these faces anymore either. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted that you're here. Um, your organization has provided a lot of information over the years to many of us in the General Assembly who are trying to figure out how to do our jobs, not in a partisan way, but frankly in a factual way. So your, your testimony is, is greatly appreciated. Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, sure. I'm going to turn over my time to a few folks I see on my side. Go ahead. Uh, so Senator Leach and Senator White, in, 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 in proper order, in deference of charm and charisma, you have it, but <laughs> in, in deference to wisdom and experience, we're going to give it to Senator White and then to Senator Leach, if you don't mind. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's the nicest thing you've ever said to me, Senator <laughs> Williams. <laughs> you know, my political history prior to getting elected in 2000 is minimal. I do know that my predecessor, Senator Pat Stapleton, uh, at one point in the 70s, he had four contiguous counties, Indiana, Armstrong, Clarion, Jefferson, basically a square. Now, what I've never figured out, there's no way that uh, each of the senators today, as far as I'm aware, represent roughly 250,000 people. So my friend Senator Williams, for example, uh, his map will be a lot smaller than mine. He could probably ride a bicycle around his district, whereas uh, I've got 3,200 square miles. And I've just always been curious about the, the arguments over uh, redistricting. Um, 
How do you handle a situation like we have in the southeast where a lot of the gerrymandering uh, occurs? How do you handle that in Allegheny County when, and Philadelphia County when there's such a majority of one party? I, I struggle to see how that, that fairness is going to be accomplished. And forgive my ignorance, I mean, maybe I'm sure you know a lot more about this issue than I do. Uh, I just look at the Pennsylvania map and think that uh, uh, I don't know what occurred in the 1970s that allowed four contiguous counties like that, but obviously we don't have that today. Uh, may I go ahead and respond? Please. Um, you, you were asking a very tough question, Senator White. Um, in part, you use the word fairness, and defining what is fair is something that will keep lawyers and courts going from here till the next century comes around. Uh, fair could mean fair in a partisan way. Fair could mean with uh, racial minorities. Fair could mean uh, that each vote is, uh, that, that the districts are competitive and, and therefore each vote counts equally. There's a bunch of different ways to define that. So, um, and there is new, uh, questions about that in terms of the partisan part in front of the Supreme Court. In fact, this very day the Supreme Court is hearing a case out of Texas, so that's the third major redistricting case that the U.S. Supreme Court has uh, taken up this year, and so maybe in June, the end of June, maybe we'll have some definitions about fairness. I will say that there's two other criteria. Um, uh, one is compactness, and uh, virtually all the states say that they want to have compact districts. But that can be in conflict with the desire to create districts that represent uh, uh, communities of interest. So if your community of interest is a um, farming community that, I, I don't know your state well enough, that runs up a river valley, that might be different a, a different geography than asking for compact. So these are hard to measure in some ways. I mean, yes, a mathematician can measure compactness. Um, I, I can't do it for you, but there is math to show what's compact. But it's harder to do that measurement when it's a community of interest. I don't know if that's helping at all, uh, other than to say that, that the, trying to balance competing uh, principles or criteria is tough, no matter who's drawing the maps. I just look at the, uh, the fairness issue and equality issue as uh, I'm not a mathematician. I can't figure out how, how you do that in a nonpartisan way uh, and get the people that you just described on this commission. Uh, it sounds to me that, that every 10 years or every four, I don't know how many, what you're proposing as far as how often we look at the map and change it. I maybe missed that part of your testimony because I was late, but um, I just look at Pennsylvania as being such a uh, such a diversified uh, state in so many ways, and I just don't know how you keep it from being political, how you keep it from the majority party uh, every cycle. If currently we do it every after the census, we we when we, when we uh, involve it then within two years after we do this. And it, my district has changed. Uh, this is my 18th year and it's changed uh, one, two, I guess three times. And, uh, but not gerrymandered to a point where uh, um, it's, it's still fair. If you look at my map in the 41st district, it's pretty, pretty consistent. And uh, I, I don't mean to be a, uh, uh, I don't, I want to be positive about this. This is my last term, so it's not going to affect me either way. But I still think it's, uh, that is a, that is going to be an obstacle that you're going to face and the commission's going to face uh, that will be very difficult to overcome. Um, uh, thank you uh, for those comments. I understand a little bit better where, where you were headed from. Um, I want to say that NCSL doesn't come forward with proposals of one kind or another, uh, so I'm not bringing a proposal to you. 
and, and then I, I'm understanding now better about if, if most of the Democratic voters are in the major city, how do you make competitive districts? And right. this has to do with the question of self-sorting. And um, you, know, you could do pie shapes, but then it, so some Democrats at the center of the pie and some Republicans out at the crest of the pie. Uh, that would get you competitive districts, but then the people in that urban area would say, wait a minute, we want to vote as a community. We, we, we want, why can't we have one person represent us? So that's where the, the tug comes, comes into play when, when the electorate is um, as separated as it is in, in your state, it sounds like, and, and in many other states as well. Thank you for testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the, the charm and the, yeah, that guy. Um, anyway, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, when I wrote my bill, you know, when I debate my fellow um, uh, redistricting reform fans, which is always an exciting evening, um, one of the things we always get into is, you know, what Senator, what the chairman referred to as picking the pickers. In the bill I introduced, I actually had uh, you know, the, the four majority minority uh, leaders or their designees and an independent ninth person with a supermajority necessary so one party could not inf enforce their will on another. That doesn't solve every kind of gerrymandering, but at least it solves the partisan gerrymandering, which in many ways I think is the most pernicious. But, you know, some people are like, you know, oh, no, no, we have to have, you know, we can't have politicians involved and so forth. It should be, a, 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 you know, citizens commission or, or whatever. My concern with that has always been that if you have random people or if you have whatever method of selection you have, if the people who select are selected are unknown, they would have the patina of impartiality, but it may turn out that seven of the nine are democratic leaning, like everyone has political preferences, and we wouldn't we wouldn't know that, right? Whereas if the people who are elected are participating at least we know who they're fighting for, okay? And that, that, that creates a certain type of transparency. But am I wrong, I mean, in the sense that in the states where they do have non-politicians, either random selection or some other selection process, how do we assure that the people selected, I, I was gonna say don't have political preferences, but everyone does. So how do we make sure that they remain outside of the room and where they're doing the redistricting, or should we, in your view, focus on, on uh, having people whose agendas we know? I mean, which way would you, would you or what, would, what have you observed with regard to that issue? Uh, thank you for the question. Again, I'm going to duck. Um, <laughs> I, I will say that in Ohio, they've chosen the approach that you chose. Everyone has a clear label. Um, if, if you're the attorney general, your party is known. If you're, you know, so all of the seven members are clearly labeled as a Democrat or a Republican, or in the future, should independents be elected, then they would be labeled that way. So that's their approach. Then they ask for there must be bipartisan support to pass a bill. So that supports the idea that, that we all are something, whether we, we joined the party or not, uh, let's, let's have it be up front. Then on the California side or um, even the um, Arizona side, where there are members who are explicitly not part of either of the two major parties, uh, then the question is, how do, you, how do you figure out, is that true? And you can look at their vote <clears throat> uh, record for years past. Did they just leave a party a year or two ago? Um, you could require that they couldn't have been part of a, uh, one of the major parties for at least five years or make a 10, I don't know. Um, so th that's one thing you could look for. Uh, I, I suppose you could be looking at the other um, civic activities that they've engaged in, and you might decide you wanted to measure based on those things. But uh, it's not so straightforward. Um, I don't know any group, uh, and thinking of the California one, it is five Democrats, five Republicans, and four of the unaffiliated. So you still have the strong um, power of the parties. And in Arizona, that is the question that's come up. Uh, the, the first time Arizona did its redistricting was in the 2000 cycle, and there were Democrats who thought that the not unaffiliated chair leaned toward the Republicans, and this time the Republicans feel that the unaffiliated chair leaned towards the Democrats. Mm. Um, two more questions. Number one, it, I'm just wondering if you can give us a little sense of how these commissions actually work on, on the ground. In other words, uh, 
when the Supreme Court struck down the lines in the congressional map in Pennsylvania, you know, the Democrats submitted proposed maps or, you know, the Republicans were working, I mean, and other independent groups were working on them. But I was participating a little bit in the Democratic maps. And, you know, even within the Democratic caucus where we all, you know, theoretically are, are at least in a partisan way on the same side, there was a lot of arguing. There was a lot of like, you know, I, I want this area, this person, you know, mm -hmm. and it wound up being a lot of staff would do this and then uh, the leadership would make a decision. But that's not really feasible in a, let's say, a nine person commission. Uh, how do they I mean, what 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 is your experience or your observations been with regard to how they when they actually get in the room? Uh, these are people, you know, they don't know every community, they don't know every township. Like, how do they actually draw these maps uh, in a way that makes sense and in a way that they can agree on? Um, another good question. There's, generally speaking, a um, staff person who pushes the buttons on the computer that's drawing the maps. And so if someone comes in and says, well, I want that little piece of that county, they, they can make that happen and then you see what are the ripples out from that. So there is um, expertise in staff of one kind or another and they are responding to the requests of the commissioners or the legislators. So in all cases there's a professional staff kind of behind the scenes. I think that would be true um, whether it's in a legislature or in a commission. Um, finally, there was a, one th thing I put in my bill which I uh, was really impressed with, um, which, <laughs> which was that um, it, uh, the courts have historically said, like, you know, like, for example, our Constitution requires districts to be compact and contiguous, and the courts have enforced contiguousness because that's easily defined. Right. But compactness, courts have often said this is a political question and we can't define that. And so... I created a mathematical formula where you had to draw lines around any proposed district and the district had to fill in 40% of the line, you know, of the circle. Um, have any of the other uh, states used any sort of objective or mathematical uh, or geometric um, criteria for drawing districts? There are a number of mathematicians and political science out there who are working on this and a lot of the work is on how to measure partisanship but there's another set of work about how to measure compactness and uh, I think that's been worked out but the question would be and I'd like to get back to you on this do any states require that that math be used to determine compactness so if we could just leave I, I know people are working on it if we could just leave that open for a little bit I'll get back to you on how do they measure compactness and is that is that, that mathematical measure of compactness used in any states or does it still come down to when you're <coughs> measuring that versus cores of uh, communities of interest, that kind of a thing? Is there the give and take still? All right. Th uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Swing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here. This is our second hearing, as has been noted, but this is the first time we've talked more about what's happening in the rest of the world or the rest of the country, right, instead of just what our current legislative proposals are before us. So I, I truly appreciate that perspective. So based on that, I have a few questions for you. So looking at the, um, you know, the slides that you showed us, obviously it's, it, the trend seems to be states going towards the commission, correct? And a commission that is more based on independence. It is not necessarily so much based on what legisl the, the legislative makeup, but more so on a citizen uh, type of uh, makeup. Is that, am I correct in thinking that? Yes. Do you know of other states and you know, what's ha what may be happening elsewhere in terms of this process? We're not the only ones, I know. Um. Uh, thank you. That, that is correct. I will say that over the decades from 1970 and certainly 1980 forward, between one and three states in any decade has moved towards a commission, and that would include Pennsylvania. Right. So there's one to three states every 10 years. Is that a trend? Is that a flood? Is that random? A little hard to say, but I'm going to say it is a trend that, that generally speaking states have gone that way and no states have gone the other way. 
Right now, we see lots and lots and lots of bills on moving towards redistricting commissions. We have seen little forward motion. We've got the Ohio example where they've um, got it on the ballot in May. Last year, a bill got out of the Delaware Senate but didn't get heard in the House. So a lot of bills, not a lot of action. There is action on ballot measures um, introduced by the citizens in the 24 states where citizens can gather signatures and put a proposal onto the ballot. Which we don't have. Ballot, which you don't have. There are efforts in seven or eight states, and I'm going to tell you that probably two or three of those will be on the ballot in November, but I could be wrong. Um, uh, so, so there's efforts on these two fronts, legislatively and um, with uh, citizens' initiatives. So there's interest in other states. I'm, I'm hearing from legislators in other states saying both minority members and my majority members. So this isn't about who's a D and who's an R. Um, and it's, I, I'm, I'm interested to note that Democrats who are in the majority, Democrats who are in the minority, Republicans who are in the majority, and Republicans in the minority, I'm getting interest from at least some folks in many states uh, on what might happen. Now, you could argue that that's because this is the year ending in eight. If you're going to do something, this is the time to do it, or moving in right. 19 is, well, in your case, I think you would have to take action this year, but in a lot of yeah. states, they could still take action in uh, 19 or 20. So it could be timing. It could also be that partisan gerrymandering is so much a part of the national debate right now with these three cases before the Supreme Court. So deciding which of those two is causing this churning right now, I'm not able to say. But certainly it, it, it's there. There's a national movement yes. as well as a statewide movement yes. that you, know, you can witness here yes. that that is definitely true. One other question. So, you know, we, we are up against a deadline. And so we have to change the Constitution. Not all of these other states, I'm sure, had to do that. And as you mentioned, other states can just put this on the a ballot and they don't have to go through the process that we do. But if there were things that we could change um, statutory, statutorily versus constitutionally, would that be a good process to take as well to at least get forward movement? Um, perhaps. I, I, I don't know well enough what would need to be constitutional and what would need to be in statute. Right. I, it's possible that creating an advisory commission that literally, truly just advises could be created statutorily, I, and, and then it still would go through the, the vote in um, the existing commission. I, I, I don't know what that would look like. Um, and it's possible that you might be able to add criteria uh, perhaps the competitive ones that I, I mentioned before, the ones that relate to politics or, or uh, more of a focus on preserving cores of, of um, existing uh, districts or uh, preserving uh, communities of interest. So it's possible that some of those might be able to be done statutorily, and, and those would be questions to take to one of your attorneys here. Right. I, so I'm in, you've, you've answered partially my next question. Would it be better for us, if, if, if this is part of our plan B, I'd prefer to really make this movement, get it done by the time, um, by this, the end of this session, so it can be voted on in the next session. That would be my preference once we come to the model that we think is the, mm -hmm. the best thing that we can do. But if, we, if, if that doesn't happen, I think we have to be thinking about What's our plan B, right? So would it be better for us? I mean, I heard Senator White talk about, you know, the, the, the compactness of the districts and the difference between a very populated area and one that's not so populated. That, that's a reality in Pennsylvania. Would it be better for us to work on the standards for the districts rather than the makeup of the committee or vice versa? And how have other states been able to do that? I know I'm asking you really difficult questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I can't answer for the reasons I've said before on which is the better approach. We've seen um, these uh, bills, and I do actually have the list with me if, if you're interested in seeing it, of states that have had bills on creating commissions and also states that have had bills on uh, changing criteria. And there's a significant overlap between those two groups. So if you're going to move to a commission, you're probably thinking about your criteria as well. But in total, if, if you just take these as separate, as columns, there are more in the change the criteria column than there are in the create or alter an existing commission column. So 
I guess other legislators are thinking along those same lines. That right. We're not the only ones that are in this same situation. Uh -huh. That's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm coming back. I have a, just a couple more questions for you, um, Ms. Unheron. Thank you for your patience. Um, have any states considered uh, electing independent citizen commissions that you know of? I have not seen that come forward in the last three or four years. It may have come forward in decades before, and I know who to ask, so I can come back to you with an answer to that. Uh, the other alternative I've seen is to have retired judges um, mm. be appointed to be on the commission. I didn't mention that because I didn't think that was going to be the preferred approach in Pennsylvania. Um, so that, that's what I've got on alternatives to what you've heard about. Do you have any thoughts on the pluses or minuses of possibly electing commissioners? I'm sorry, say again, please. Do you have any thoughts on the pluses or minuses of, of uh, possibly electing uh, commissioners? From your experiences, as you've seen around the state, because we're trying to do what is best here. We're trying to create a fair redistricting process here. I, I don't have much to offer on that, but I, I will say that some states elect judges and other states don't. And in the states where they do elect judges, people say oh, that's making our judges partisan. And in the states where they don't elect judges, they say they're not accountable to the people. Although usually they go on the ballot later on that you can kick them off the bench if you don't like the work that they're doing. So I'm going to guess that there are, in fact, pluses and minuses to doing it that way. You could argue that by running an extra election for it, you're um, doing a different version of a Rube Goldberg plan with you know, that many more steps. Or you could say then the people who are, um, th that the people chose who would um, be doing their redistricting. Of course, they also did elect you all. So, um, uh, so I'm not sure about that piece. Uh, if, if I can come up with something really great on that behind the scenes, I'll, I'll share and that back Please with share you. it with us, and yeah. I'm sure we'll be in contact. Yeah. Um, do you think states that use a supermajorities are better able to approve maps that are less partisan? I do think I can say yes to that. Okay. Yeah. And my last question, and, and again, thank you for your patience. Um, since Pennsylvania doesn't have a commission on appellate court appointees like Arizona, <clears throat> what characteristics would Pennsylvania need to consider to find a comparable state agency that might be able to generate a pool of nominees for appointment to an independent redistricting commission? I, I know that in California they use the state auditor, but the truth is I have no idea what a state auditor does and whether you have a similar function here. Um, so uh, that's a place to look. Um, I could imagine... I. I you might be looking for places that aren't elected on a partisan basis, so the Secretary of State probably wouldn't be the right place to look because that's a partisan position here. Um, again, I'm not sure I know. Give some thought and, yeah. and out for that because yeah. I would be interested in your, your opinion. Yeah. Uh, we are up against a timeline here, so we, yeah. we, we need those thoughts uh, quickly. You're at the top um, of my list right at the moment, <laughs> Senator. Um, listen, thank you. Right. Um, as noted earlier, <clears throat> you're, 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 unless somebody else has any questions. Sure. What's that so. to the question which was asked you about elected folks? Uh, ironically, that's why we're here. Uh, we elect our Supreme Court, and there were a lot of people who uh, flip flop back and forth based upon the composition of the Supreme Court. And our Supreme Court uh, process is a very partisan one, special interest on both sides, electing <laughs> certain types of judges. Um, so, I, not an answer for you, answer for us. I, I think that's like probably. Um, going back in the same direction we, we're currently stuck, um, being divided over not even R versus D, just left versus right. So, Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Underhill? <clears throat> seeing none, um, seeing none. Uh, as noted earlier, uh, you're, you're through. Uh, hmm. and, um, and thank you so much for your patience. Uh, you answered a lot of tough questions. And uh, we really appreciate your expertise. Thank you so much. Well, it was a pleasure to be here. And uh, you might imagine that I learned a few things in the last few weeks as I prepped. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. <laughs>